This is my first case in homicide. They weren't referred to by a surname and a first name, but by their street names. And also in this case, there was a vodka bottle. I've been doing this now, homicides now, for 10 years, and he is one of the uh, wickedest people I have dealt with. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. The Brothers Grimm made up fairy tales that warn children about the evils of the world. This is a contemporary Grimm fairy tale. Only it's true. Exhibit A, not what was in the bottle, but the bottle itself. The fire is in a three-story derelict house in one of the city's most upscale neighborhoods. Because it's been boarded up, the fire is confined to one front room. As firefighters assess the damage, they detect an odor. If you've ever experienced the smell of a burnt victim um, within the confines of a structure, it's something you don't soon forget. The body is charred beyond recognition. Initially, it's thought the victim is a transient who fell asleep while smoking. To confirm the cause of death and help determine the victim's identity, the body is sent to the morgue to be autopsied by a forensic pathologist. The back of the body showed two areas where the skin had been spared from the effects of heat. The skin was clearly white. There was a charred gag in the mouth of the individual, and obviously a gag in the mouth would preclude smoking and careless use of cigarette butts. The body appeared to be that of a young female. I stopped what I was doing at that stage and uh, awaited the arrival of the homicide investigators. This was my first case in homicide. It became quite clear that this was not a, a fire death at all. In fact, it was a homicide, and a rather brutal homicide. The uh, cause of death in this case was attributed to ligature strangulation effected by the elastic material in the bra, which was tightly bound twice around the, uh, the neck. There was evidence of injury to the vagina that this woman was bound around the ankles and had the effect of fire not been so great, it would be my opinion that she was equally bound by the wrists because of the uh, sexual assault aspect of it, because of the forcible confinement and the, uh, uh, the arms being uh, tied, the ligature across the throat, uh, the um, uh, gag in the mouth, uh, various other aspects of it. It was always a first degree murder. Now that it's an official homicide, investigators return to the house. They searched the front room where the body was found, looking for clues. Then they head for the second and third floors.
once at the third floor, it became quite obvious somebody had set up a small room at the front of the house. Detectives would later discover the place was a squat house for street kids. There was rats running around. Um, there was human excrement all over because they had been using this place f for what they call a squat. And of course that's what squat means. We squat and we do our thing. Some of the rooms were actually knee deep in discarded items. Detectives survey the crime scene, but the IDENT people actually collect the evidence. Well, we never know in the first instance, you know, what, what role any particular item can play in the thing. And you can assume that it's, it's going to have considerable importance in some way, but again, at that time, you really don't know. At this point, the investigation has two major prongs, to find out who committed the murder and to determine the victim's identity. We started uh, searching our own Toronto files to begin with for missing persons. We had an approximate age. We had a, a female who a range of age was uh, 15 to, to 25, 30. We had no idea. We put out a request through the media, and as a result of that, there was a, one phone call from an officer in Niagara region who um, hooked up the, a missing person down there we uh, got dental records, and from the dental records, an odontologist matched up uh, the teeth, and that, that's how we did our identification of her. The victim was a 16-year-old girl, the youngest daughter of professional parents. She was from a small city near Niagara Falls. Her name was Cynthia Ray. As a last gasp of freedom before starting a summer job at a local burger joint, Cynthia Ray and a young friend had hitchhiked into Toronto to spend a weekend hanging out in the punk scene. That was on a Friday. On the following Tuesday morning, her charred remains had been discovered. What had happened in between? And who had murdered Cynthia Ray? Grady's investigation plunged him into a unique and alien culture, the punk and skinhead universe. They didn't, they weren't referred to by a surname and a first name, but by their street names. So we got familiar with those street names. And then when we referred to them as their street names, uh, I think they appreciated it. They were quite cooperative to, to speak with. Yeah, we had some of these kids come in and they would have uh, uh, their uh, Doc Martin boots. Like there were all kinds of different boots they wore. Paratrooper boots, there was uh, army boots, there were police boots. Within this little hierarchy, uh, Doc Martins were the ones that everybody wanted to wear. Investigators eventually discovered Cynthia Ray had been seen with a guy whose street name was Rodent. Rodent was a punk from a well-to-do family. He'd met Cynthia on Saturday afternoon when she bought a bunch of them some fast food and booze. Cynthia was what was known as a poser, a kid who lived at home during the week and made the scene on the weekends. On the plus side, she had a bank account. When Rodent noticed Cynthia had too much to drink, he felt sorry for her. There was a woman there who was out taking photographs of interesting people. And there was a group of which the now deceased, they were amongst the group of people who were being photographed along with some other street kids. Rodin and Cynthia slept in a park Saturday night. The next day, Sunday, they hung out together and later had sex in a parking lot stairwell.
But when Rodent called home and found out that a girl he'd met in Europe was at his parents' house, he decided to go home. The last time he'd seen Cynthia Ray, she was talking to a couple of guys she knew. Sean Ross, who was known as football, at this time was 16 years of age. The other, James Harbottle, he was a little older. I think he was uh, 19 or 20 at the time of the, the offense. He was a punk rocker. He had his hair in a mohawk at one point. Uh, he had it shaved right down uh, at one point. Um, he had leather jackets, studs. He was more of a, a guy who had, uh, had a rough life and lived on the streets because of his rough life. It turned out Harbottle had met Cynthia and a friend when they were panhandling the month earlier. He gave them a tab of acid. That night, while her friend slept in a nearby bed, Cynthia had sex with Harbottle. The place where they had spent the night was the same squat house where a month later, Cynthia was found murdered. Harbottle's street name was Evil. Meanwhile, the vodka bottle had been sent to the Center of Forensic Science to be analyzed. One of the issues was whether she'd been sexually assaulted. And so routinely in homicide cases, we get a number of medical samples uh, to check to see whether or not there's semen present. I had those, and also in this case, there was a vodka bottle. In this particular case, I noticed some crusty yellow material in the area around the bottle cap. What we want to do is get the, um, get the material off, and then it's simply a question of, of swabbing that area. So from looking at the bottle, swabbing off the material, and then testing it, this is what we find. First, that we have spermatozoa present, Secondly, that we have epithelial cells present. And thirdly, that they're vaginal epithelial cells because there's a lot of glycogen present in most of the cells. That combination plus the typing was consistent with the Crown's theory of what had happened, which was that the vodka bottle had been inserted vaginally. This confirmed Rodent had slept with Cynthia, but what about Evil or Ross? All we knew at that time is they were the last ones to be seen with the deceased, and off they had gone. And we had no story from then until when the deceased is found. So we wanted to locate them and find out, was there another perpetrator, was there something else? Did they um, perhaps smoke a joint or whatever and just leave her with somebody else? We had to find them. Grady received a report that Evelyn Ross were stopped on the outskirts of Toronto by a police officer and told to move on. The officer noted that Ross had a pair of eight-hole Doc Martin boots. Cynthia Ray had eight-hole Doc Martins. The next report was that they had hitched out west together. Then Evil and Ross split up. When Grady found out Ross, AKA football, had been transported back to Montreal, he was anxious to talk to him. I thought he could probably be the best witness in this case. And if you think of it, uh, uh, the one guy's street name is football. The other's is evil. And I mean, it, it may be very basic, but when you're dealing with this, and one was 16 and the other was a little older, one was a bit more of a leader on the street scene being evil, a guy who'd been around the streets a bit longer. He had a bit of a, a checkered past, been in and out of trouble with the police, whereas Ross, at this stage, was 16 and didn't seem to have the history that we knew of at that time. And as we're interviewing him, we realize he has a pair of eight-hole Doc Martin boots on. When I showed Ross the picture, of the deceased wearing the boots at the Eaton Center with the other people, all friends of his. He took a look at the picture and he just moved back. He goes, they're hers, take them. And he took the boots right off there and gave them to us. 
Ross claimed evil had sold him the boots. Then he told detectives about running into evil and Cynthia on that fateful Sunday night and how they'd invited him to come back to the squat with them to smoke some hash. The only way into the squat was a third floor window and Ross helped Cynthia climb in. They smoked and went to sleep. And then in the morning, he got up, went off to uh, the Scott Mission, got some new clothes, and then uh, met up with um, uh, Harbottle, and off they went to uh, Points West. He basically gave us uh, Harbottle with exclusive opportunity. Meaning he didn't say he saw evil kill Cynthia, but he certainly implied it. But Grady didn't entirely buy Ross's story. He had a hunch Ross was more involved than he was letting on. You know, there was nothing to substantiate it, but uh, we were much more concerned after the interview than we were, you know, before, that's for sure. At this time, blood samples were voluntary. Through his lawyer, Ross declined to give one. But the detectives rushed back in to collect the used cigarette butts for saliva samples. We actually take the paper itself, and then we would extract, put it into a uh, special liquid. In the case of ABO typing, it's just uh, water, because the ABO substances are soluble in water. The ABO system could not nail a suspect, but it could exclude one. Ross was an A secretor, so he was eliminated because there was no group A substance found on the vodka bottle or on the vaginal swabs from the deceased. Maybe Grady's hunch about Ross was wrong. Maybe he'd been telling the truth, that evil was the sole sick murderer. But when they eventually caught up with evil, he would tell quite a different story. Grady had been getting police updates about evil's whereabouts, but he still couldn't catch him. Then something he never expected happened. Evil called him. He was phoning and trying to say that he was a nice guy. He didn't do anything, he doesn't know what went on. And uh, we had him arrested while he was in a payphone. For the first time, Grady was face to face with Evil. Grady had a tape recorder with him. He turned it on and asked Evil if he wanted to say anything. This is a story Evil told him on the ride back. Yes, Ross had run into him and Cynthia that Sunday night. And yes, they'd helped Cynthia climb into the squat. And yes, they'd smoked some hash and gone to sleep. But this is where Evil's story differed from Ross's. In Evil's account, both he and Ross had gone off in the morning to the Scott mission to get clean clothes, leaving Cynthia still sleeping. But according to Evil, he and Ross both went back to the squat. Ross wanted sex, and when Cynthia wasn't interested, Ross said, Let's rape her. Evil thought it was a prank, but it suddenly got serious when Ross started cutting off Cynthia's clothes and tied her up. Then Ross sexually assaulted Cynthia with the vodka bottle. Cynthia cried she was going to the police, so Ross took Evil to the next room and said, well then, we're going to have to kill her. And Evil said, go for it but do it kindly. But there was nothing kind about it. Evil and Ross tried cutting her wrists. When that didn't work, they carried her downstairs and strangled her with her bra. Then they went out to huff some glue. That's when they decided to return to the squat and hide Cynthia's body under an overturned couch and set the whole thing on fire. It was brutal and sadistic. Ross, meanwhile, was on the lam. It took police two months to find him. He's arrested in Montreal for doing a robbery of a kid. And the robbery was for a pair of eight-hole Doc Martin boots. Evil was charged with first-degree murder and sentenced to life. 
but Ross denied any part in Cynthia Ray's murder. He uh, has never admitted to it. Has never admitted his, his part. Has uh, denied everything. Denied sexually assaulting the deceased in this matter. Has uh, denied anything to do with the vodka bottle or anything like that. Evil was willing to testify against Ross, but what judge or jury would believe him? It would all come down to the vodka bottle. Exhibit A. We're all used to hearing about the phenomenal results of DNA, but only with fingerprints do you get an absolute match. What we're looking at is just the root structures, any place where they divide or where they end, uh, where there are small dots. Uh, these are all individual characteristics or characteristics that are unique to that one impression. There is no, no reported uh, or known case of two persons' fingerprints being the same. Okay, this is the actual bottle from the crime scene. They have applied the uh, photograph here uh, to show the actual location of the print. This impression is the left ring finger of uh, Sean Ross. This is on, a, on the item in a position consistent with the scenario of, of Ross using this to sexually assault the victim. I think that's what they call the clincher. Thanks to this forensic evidence, Sean Ross, a.k.a. Football, was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life. Because he was a young offender at the time of the incident, he would be eligible for parole in 10 years. Ross had no conscience, had no remorse. Harbottle, as diminished as the remorse was, at least there was some, as his remorse, to me at least, was for his lack of action dealing with Ross. I, I think Ross did it because he liked the power, the control, and as he's told other witnesses, he liked watching the eyes bug out. That gave him a lot of power and control. I've been doing this now, the homicides now, for 10 years, and he is one of the uh, 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 wickedest people I have dealt with. Most of the time, we don't get involved with the people. We get involved with samples, but there are still cases doesn't matter, they get to you no matter how you try and keep them from doing so. And usually those are really nasty cases. They're the kind that can give you nightmares. How many of us can think of the close calls of our youth when we unknowingly put ourselves in awful danger and how lucky we were to escape? Cynthia Ray had her whole life ahead of her. Like so many teenagers before her, she was just trying to fit into a scene. The tragedy is that on that fateful Sunday night, Cynthia Ray got too close to the flame when she entered the house where evil lives. It's like he's playing a game with you. He's, he's trying to find out what you have by the questions you ask. If he's her guardian, and I believe he was, he's not doing a whole lot to help her this time. So that's why I believe that that was the last day. Is it a bite? Is it a human bite? Also, it was an aggressive type bite mark because it was a single penetration. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. One of his dozens of love letters went like this. Never stop believing in yourself as I believe in you. No matter what happens, Natalia, I will always be there for you. My love for you is unconditional. Where does love end and obsession begin? Exhibit A, a bite mark on a body. 
Natalia Mazursky was 21 when she arrived from Russia on Valentine's Day, 1992. Her family was heartbroken to see her go, but knew that life would be better for their daughter in Canada, the promised land. She came to marry Ivan Kravchik, a Russian boy who had immigrated before her. But the marriage broke up after a few short months and Ivan moved out west, later filing for divorce. Natalia, now all alone in a new country, decided to enroll at university in interior design. At home, she'd been a talented painter. In her first two years in Canada, she had several exhibitions of her work. By this time, she had met Alex Plotkin, another Russian who had grown up in Canada. They eventually started living together. Natalia felt they were meant for each other. But it was a stormy relationship, and she asked Alex to move out. Around that time, Gilbert Ho, a friend of a friend, helped her get a job at a trendy downtown restaurant. That's where she met Glenn Rollins. Glenn had money and was a regular at the restaurant. Less than a month after he had known her, they became engaged. But after a drunken confrontation one night, it all ended. But Natalia wasn't the kind of woman you could easily forget. They all stayed in touch with her. It was on a Monday morning in January when Natalia's phone started to ring. It rang on and off all day and night, but no one answered it. No one. Hey, Princess, it's me. Good morning. I took care of all that divorce stuff with Ivan for you, so not to worry. Hey, Natalia, I'm just picking up a pizza and bringing it over. Hey, it's me, uh, just getting off work. I was gonna come over. Where are you? It's Ivan. I've been calling you. Give me a call. It continued to ring over the next two days and nights. Hey, where were you? Natalia, this is Ivan. Hey, Nat, it's Annie. Didn't see you at school today. People have been looking for you. Hope you got the rent money together. Otherwise, you're going to get evicted. Bye, Princess. Talk to you later. Just give me a call so I know you're okay. By Thursday, her friend Gilbert Ho, the bartender from the restaurant, was worried enough to get the superintendent to check on her apartment. Something horrible had happened. Natalia is dead. Gilbert calls police. Homicide is brought in. It was a very cold day. The door was open to the balcony, and I thought perhaps it was for the dog. You don't leave your balcony door open in, in January. The first thing that I remember when I walked in the apartment was a small bathroom to my left and I could see a body in the bathtub. The bedroom door was opened. That tells you where it happened. The body is a crime scene unto itself. It tells its own story. The striking injuries in this case were those to the, uh, to the head area. And uh, the face, for example, showed multiple lacerations, lacerations or tears of the skin. The red marks here are indicating the sites of lacerations. This is tearing of the uh, skin from, as you can see here, the forehead, as well as both the right and left sides of the uh, scalp. So, one can say that uh, we're dealing with a blunt object and 
uh, we're dealing with a, a very large number, greater than 20 uh, blows or impacts to the head. An injury like this suggests the possibility of a hammer or hammer-like object, which is what they found when the tub was drained. The number of blows to the head and face indicates a great deal of anger towards the victim. Then the pathologist noticed something that was going to prove invaluable for investigators. There was a, an abrasion, which is a scraping of the skin around the uh, left nipple. And it was the configuration, the shape of this uh, abrasion, which was semicircular, which suggested to, to myself uh, that uh, this uh, may well have been a, a bite mark. The use of teeth and bite marks for forensic identification purposes goes back over a hundred years. The first question or the first fork in the road is, is it a bite? And then the second fork in the road is, is it a human bite? And then the third fork in the road is, which human? Well, in this case, it was, uh, there were two markings, one above the nipple and one below the nipple on the deceased. And uh, the markings were consistent with a human bite. And furthermore, they were consistent with a bite mark, in my opinion, that was of a, a, a sexual nature, being as it was on the breast. And also, it was an aggressive type bite mark because it was a single penetration, fleeting sexual bite where there was grasping, enough pressure to break the skin, but yet there was no central bruising that one would see, say, for example, with a, with a hickey or uh, an affectionate bite mark. Dr. Wood also determines that the bite mark was made at the same time as the head wounds. It suggests that whoever bit Natalia Mazursky had also murdered her. The blows to the head, the vicious bite mark, the drowning. Someone's hatred had exploded at this beautiful young woman. Would exhibit A, this human bite mark, be enough to catch a brutal killer? In the week following Natalia's murder, Detective Mike Hamill returns repeatedly to her apartment. He needs to take it all in at his own pace, piece by piece, clue by clue. You have to spend a lot of time there. You have to look around. You have to sit there and look and try to put pieces together in your own mind. I'm trying to figure out what, what, what happened. There's no signs of forcible entry. So obviously, she invited them in. There was no blood from, from the bed on the floor to the bathroom. And normally, when the bodies uh, moved, right after the murder or after being assaulted, there's blood involved, you'll see drag marks in this. It's, it happens very quickly. In order to interpret the scene, investigators call in blood expert Susan Kern. The blood spatter adds to the chilling story of the murder. They called me here to assist them to understand uh, if the beating actually occurred in the bedroom and that she was later transported to the bathroom. Um, and how to best photograph these stains to preserve the information at the scene. It all appears to originate from somewhere on the bed, traveling, as you can see by the arrows, um, outwards from this location. If a, a hammer, in this case, has been used to deliver repeated blows, to a surface that is continuing to produce liquid blood from it, such as a head. During the swinging of the weapon, uh, the liquid blood will come away from the surface of the hammer itself, and those droplets will impact on whatever surface is uh, uh, around, such as the ceiling. And in, in my mind, the only way to get from one room to the other room without leaving a lot of blood is that she had been wrapped up in, in say, a blanket or a sleeping bag or something of that nature to prevent the blood from dripping onto the floor. One of the biggest puzzles in the, in the bedroom was a ring of blood on the dresser. She had one dresser in her bedroom. And it's like uh, someone had taken the cup, a cup, placed it on the bed, in, on the blood, while it was still fresh, and then placed the cup on the dresser. And then, in the bathroom, we found a cup, which appeared to be the same size as, as of the one 
of the ring on the dresser. Hamill felt the fact that the killer moved around from room to room with this cup meant that he was at ease in Natalia's apartment. I was satisfied that the person who killed her was very close to her. From Natalia's birth control pills and an interview with Natalia's neighbor who remembered hearing a loud bang on his adjacent bedroom wall, the time of death is established as late Sunday or early Monday morning. Hamill began to investigate his suspects, keeping in mind that one of them had viciously bitten Natalia. The first person Detective Hamill brought into interview on videotape was Gilbert Ho, because he was the first person to discover the body. He came across as someone that she needed because she was going through some difficult times in her life. And um, he, he came across as uh, her crying shoulder whenever she needed someone. He was the guy. He left several messages on her answering machine. Those messages were left after she, she was dead. Gilbert had helped her with a school project that Sunday night, the last time he saw her alive. He said that her ex-husband, Ivan, phoned from out west that night to discuss their divorce. Gilbert offered to help her with the details. Ivan's voice was also identified on her answering machine several days after they believed she was murdered. Gilbert, who claimed to also be Natalia's sometime lover, said Natalia later got a call from some guy she said she was going out to meet. That's why Gilbert left her at 11.30 on Sunday night. Had the mysterious caller been her murderer? The cops asked Gilbert if he knew anything else about the other men in Natalia's life. Gilbert told him about her boyfriend, Alex. A shirt of his was found on her bedroom floor soaked in blood. Alex's voice was also identified on her answering machine. Gilbert told detectives that he had more than once had to console Natalia in the restaurant after a row with Alex. Alex admitted having sex with her on the Friday and Saturday before her murder. When I first met her boyfriend, he was very, very emotionally upset. A nice, easygoing guy, a very pleasant. I can see why she would like him. The final suspect was a doozy, Glenn Rollins, her ex-fiance from the restaurant. Glenn was very possessive of Natalia, and one night shortly after they were engaged, he barged into her apartment building drunk. He claimed Natalia was playing him for a sucker and demanded his engagement ring back. When she wouldn't open the door, he became enraged. This was just one month before Natalia's murder. And of course, he became a suspect because of that. I mean, he's just don't come over and break down the door with a sledgehammer. Glenn was charged with assault. When she was later found murdered, the media was all over him. Their theory was that he was a spurned lover with a streak of violence. These were the four suspects. Mike Hamill would need to make bite mark impressions from all of them. While Hamill was still investigating, Natalia's family came over from Russia to attend her funeral. You could tell us when you met the family. I mean, we have, our cultures are way off. They're very different. And uh, you could sense this, the feeling from these people that just couldn't understand, how could this happen? In addition to Natalia's family, three of the suspects were also there. Ivan, Alex, and Gilbert. Mike Hamill was there too as a mourner and an investigator. In these types of cases, any other homicide cases, you're gonna end up with a number of suspects. The faster you eliminate them, the more time you'll have to spend on your real suspect. 
Ivan Kravchik, Natalia's ex-husband, still lived out west, and it didn't appear that he could have flown in and committed the murder. He had a perfect alibi, so he was out of the picture as a suspect. As for Alex Plotkin, on the night of the murder, his roommate swore he'd been sleeping on the couch and was still there when she returned from work late that night. But he had his own place, and we had an, an alibi for him as well. Then there was Gilbert Ho. He came over to Detective Hamill and thanked him for coming. This was tough for Hamill because he had begun to suspect Gilbert. Of course, we suspected that he was the murderer, and it's, sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to be there and play a role, you know, play the dummy. Yeah, of course you have to. Hamill had suspicions from his very first interview with Mr. Ho. He was drained out of his emotions, and he, there should have been something more. He was claiming to be a very good friend, and very good friend don't react the way he did. Investigators also learned that even though Gilbert had a wife and two young children, he had paid for all of Natalia's furniture and her rent. People from the restaurant where they worked said that Gilbert was in love with Natalia. When we spoke to Gilbert Ho, we asked him uh, if he loved her, and uh, yes, he loved her. We asked him uh, if he had sex with her. He said he did. I don't believe he did, ever. I asked him, well, did you bite her? And the next question, if he's willing to say, well, I, I didn't bite her, but I may have sucked on her, I sucked on her breast, okay, well, the next question is, would you have hurt her? No, I would never hurt her. Gilbert was willing to give Detective Hamill his bite mark impression right away. So was Alex. But what about Glenn Rollins, Natalia's ex fiance who had assaulted her? He had an alibi for the night of the murder, too. That he'd gone to see Get Shorty with a friend. Glenn Rollins agreed to give Hamill his bite mark impression in exchange for dropping the assault charges. It would all come down to the bite mark impressions. Here you have uh, the three suspects' models. The question has to be looked at from two ways. Is it this person? And, and that's important to the police. And can I, can I exclude this person? Uh, and if I can exclude the person, certainly that's very important to the, to the police, for the, for the police to know as well. This is the tape that was uh, shown to the jury that was made uh, from the computer. Uh, and what we have here, we have suspect three's teeth, which we are uh, superimposing on the bite mark over the breast. These teeth are uh, obviously not a match. They're far too wide. They're at an odd angulation for this uh, to be a possible match, both in the upper and in the lower arch. So we're moving on now to the uh, second suspect. But again, they're too large. The arch is too large. And where there are teeth that should be leaving marks, there are no marks. And now we have uh, Mr. Ho's dentition and the corrected uh, teeth here. And they fit. They fit quite nicely. He's got a smaller arch. And uh, the teeth can be seen to be in the proper position for making the blackened bruises that appear uh, both above and below the nipple. The outlines of the teeth fit very nicely with the bruises. You'll see them disappear, and the bruises appear right beneath where the uh, markings are. So I concluded that this was a match. I believe, and I'm not certain, that Mr. Ho denied making a bite mark on the, on the breast, and now we have somehow, miraculously, his, his dentition's print on this woman's breast. This is the story that Detective Hamill and his team were able to piece together. It turned out that Gilbert was broke. The checks he had written for Natalia's rent had bounced, and she was going to be evicted the very next day. And she didn't even know it. So when Gilbert went over to Natalia's that Sunday night, he knew this might be his last night with his princess and that the relationship was about to change. Here's this poor girl. She's about to be evicted. She has no clue this is about to happen. And her guardian, if he's her guardian, and I believe he was, he's not doing a whole lot to help her this time. So that's why I believe that that was her last day. Hamill believed Gilbert wanted sex. After everything he had done for Natalia, it was the least she could do for him. 
When she refused, he exploded in outrage. He bludgeoned her, then he bit her, then he thought about what to do next. He wrapped her head in the towel and carried her to the tub to try to cover it up. It's the only mistake he made was he bit her. Because without that, we could not put Mr. Ho at the scene at the time of her death. Gilbert Ho was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. He was obsessed with her. If he could not have her, no one else could. No matter what happens, I will always be there for you. My love for you is unconditional. Maybe Natalia, anxious to fit into her newly adopted country, ignored the signs of Gilbert Ho's obsession. Maybe she didn't have the heart to tell him to leave her alone. The tragedy is no one else did either. Natalia Mazursky was buried almost three years to the day she arrived in this country on Valentine's Day. She will always remain a beautiful Russian princess. <laughs>